Hello, everyone, and welcome back to We're All Mad Here, episode 121. I'm your host, Rachel. Winston Churchill made famous the black dog metaphor for depression by using it in a letter to his wife Clementine in 1911. He had been speaking to a friend's wife who had been treated by a doctor for her depressive episodes. To Clementine, he wrote, I think this doctor might be useful to me if my black dog returns. Decades after that letter, when biography after biography was being written about Churchill, that metaphorical sentence was seized upon and Churchill became one of the most famous depressives in history. But there are a few problems with this idea. First, Churchill was hardly the first person to assign the symbolism of a black dog to his depression, but more importantly, and perhaps most confusingly, Churchill might not have had depression at all. I usually use bits and pieces from a ton of sources for each episode, but because I got most of my information from two main sources, I wanted to recognize them up front. The first is the book Clementine by Sophia Purnell, and the second is the Black Dog episode of Andrew Jenks' podcast, What Really Happened, which featured an interview with one of the most acclaimed Churchill biographers, Paul Reed. So first, let's look at the Black Dog metaphor. It actually goes back as far as humans have been telling stories, appearing in early English folklore, as well as Greek, Roman, Egyptian, Middle Eastern, and Norse mythologies. References to a black dog being symbolic of dark feelings or figures such as the devil appear as far back as the year 1 AD. But where Churchill got it was one of his favorite writers, Samuel Johnson. Johnson used the metaphor in his own letter to a friend, writing, what will you do to keep away the black dog that worries you at home? Years later, Churchill would use the phrase himself and somehow was chosen as the one who gave birth to the idea. Obviously, this isn't true, but as Jenks points out in his podcast, quote, The black dog we know today is Churchill's, and it is against his own personal history that it takes on its contemporary dimensions, reconfiguring depression as something from which one can separate oneself, something to be named, lived with. Winston Leonard Spencer Churchill was born on November 30th, 1874. His childhood would not be called a happy one. While he had a very loving nanny, Mrs. Everest, his parents left something to be desired. His American-born mother was too busy being a socialite to pay young Winston much attention, and his father took very little interest in him. Randolph Spencer Churchill also had very little interest in his wife, Jenny. The couple had become engaged just three days after meeting and were married within the year, but their love at first sight passion had all but disappeared by the time Winston and his brother Jack were born. The couple, though married until Randolph's death, were effectively estranged by the time little brother Jack was born, and plenty of historians doubt whether Jack was Randolph's son. When he reached school age, Winston was sent off to boarding school, where his parents would leave him unvisited for months or years, despite the pleading letters Winston would send home. At school, Winston was bullied, and Sophia Purnell believes that this was only the beginning of his lifelong insecurities. He spoke with a lateral lisp and a stutter through most of his life that authors in the 20s and 30s described as severe and agonizing, even as an adult. At 21, Winston joined the British Army, with whom he saw action in British India, the Anglo-Saxon War, and the Second Boer War. But Winston was known less for his prowess as a soldier and more for his way with words, becoming a rather famous war correspondent. In 1900, he was elected an MP as a conservative, though he joined the Liberal Party in 1904 and later switched back to the Conservative Party. But despite holding around 20 different, high-ranking political positions throughout his life, Winston was not seen as some kind of genius at the beginning of his career. In fact, after his overseeing of the Gallipoli campaign during World War I proved disastrous, Winston left politics altogether for a few years, instead choosing to return to the army in the Royal Scots Fusiliers. Winston met Clementine Hosier in March of 1908 at a dinner party. Winston was taken by the young woman because, while she was technically a woman of society, she also earned her own living as a dressmaker and milliner. Clementine was always very self-conscious of the fact that she needed to have a job to keep up with the Joneses. But Winston admired her work ethic, her independence, and her intelligence. He was so focused on her at the party that every other guest noticed. The two began writing to each other not a month after meeting. In his very first letter to Clementine, Winston wrote, 
What a comfort and pleasure it was to me to meet a girl with so much intellectual quality and such strong reserves of noble sentiment. Despite Winston's busy political schedule, the two managed to meet up several more times in the next few months, though never alone, as well as exchange constant letters. In August, five months after they'd first met, Winston invited Clementine, through his cousin Sonny, to the family estate at Blenheim, where she met his mother, cousin, his best friend and best friend's wife, and the private secretary from the Board of Trade. The circumstances certainly promised there would be few chances for the two to sneak off for anything private, even a conversation. But Winston did manage to get Clementine alone in the estate's rose garden the morning after her arrival. By the time this visit happened, Clementine was sure that she was in love with Winston, and was positive that this walk through the garden was going to lead to a proposal. And yet, when their walk was finished, Winston hadn't said anything that even hinted at a future together. From Purnell's book, quote, A summer shower drove the couple to take shelter in a little Greek temple folly. Clementine spotted a spider scuttling across the floor, and with steely determination, quietly decided that if Winston had not declared himself before it reached a crack in the flagstones, she would leave regardless. Happily, just in time, Winston asked if she would marry him. The two had an engagement of just a month before they were married on September 12, 1908. Winston was a minor celebrity by this point, due to his well-known writing and his outspoken ways as a politician. And when the newly married couple stepped out of the church, policemen had to hold back excited crowds of onlookers. The two honeymooned in Italy, and just a month after they returned, Clementine was pregnant. The couple would have five children in all. Diana, born in 1909, Randolph, born in 1911, Sarah in 1914, Marigold in 1918, and Mary in 1922. While sources called Winston a loving and even enthusiastic father, Winston expected a lot of his children, and on the rare occasion he was home for an extended period of time, he described being in the house with his children as being bunged up with brats. In 1917, Winston was again in politics, in the Ministry of Munitions. He served as a member of parliament until 1922. A month before the November 1922 general election, Winston had surgery for appendicitis, and the election saw him losing his seat to a prohibitionist. And so from 1922 to 1924, Winston and his growing family lived mostly in France, where he painted and worked on his memoirs, as well as what would amount to a five-volume series about the First World War. By 1924, he was back in Parliament as the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Despite holding so many political offices, Winston was considered a political failure until he became Prime Minister in 1940. He relied heavily on Clementine to keep his spirits and confidence up. He was not a natural public speaker, even besides his speech impediments. So once he'd written an upcoming speech, he would have Clementine edit it, he would memorize it, and then he would practice it with Clementine over and over until it was perfect. Winston and Clementine's marriage was certainly not perfect. As a politician of rising fame, Winston traveled often, and though he admired his wife's intelligence, he could also be dismissive of her. He had been overheard on more than one occasion at this or that party, chastising her with comments like, please don't interrupt Clemmy, when Clementine offered her opinion on something. However, at its core, the marriage was a loving and supportive one that lasted 57 years. In that time, the couple exchanged around 1,700 notes and letters. And so it is interesting that out of those 1,700 letters, only one of them mentions Winston's black dog, or indeed any reference, metaphorical or otherwise, of depression. So why then is Churchill one of the most well-documented depressives in history? Well, as What Really Happened host Andrew Jenks points out, quote, well-documented doesn't mean accurately documented. William Manchester, an American historian and biographer, wrote a number of books, two of them focusing on Winston. Intended to be a three-volume collection, he titled the series The Last Lion, and lovingly detailed Winston Churchill's life, including Winston's alleged depression. His main source on the diagnosis was Manchester's friend, Lord Moran, who had been Winston's psychiatrist. Manchester had every intention of seeing the Last Lion collection to the end, but after his wife's death in 1998, he had two strokes and was unable to finish. Instead, he asked journalist and author Paul Reed to write the third volume. The two worked together on it until Manchester's death in 2004. Reed was not only a friend of Manchester, but a fan. 
he also looked up to Winston Churchill and Manchester's account of the man's life. But as he read Manchester's first two volumes and did his own research, Reed was unconvinced that Winston actually suffered from chronic depression. As he read through not only Winston's papers and letters, but documents, both public and private, that discussed Winston, Reed kept a spreadsheet of the occasions depression was mentioned in any way. Of course, he noted that famous 1911 letter to Clementine that referenced his black dog, but in the thousands of letters and documents written by Winston, Clementine, the Churchill children, staffers, and colleagues over many decades, he found not a single additional mention of depression. Reed does note that by depression, he means severe bouts of it that left Winston debilitated, that were not caused by a significant event. When Winston had written that letter to Clementine, not only had he just been voted out of office, but his mother had just died. Because of this, Reed says, while Winston may have had episodes of minor depression caused by specific circumstances, as many adults do, he probably didn't have chronic depression. If he had, Reed points out, Surely there would have been even one offhand comment in a letter from one colleague to another about how Winston seemed uninterested in his work or unusually distracted or hadn't shown up for a meeting in weeks. Wouldn't there be a staffer who noted that Winston couldn't get out of bed for days on end? Wouldn't Clementine have mentioned in a letter to one of her children that their father was yet again debilitated by that familiar sadness? Wouldn't Winston, who was very candid about his emotions in his letters to his wife, have even hinted at feelings of despondence? So if no one in Winston's life, or Winston himself, seemed to be bothered by his alleged depression, why are there biographies of Winston that are just dedicated to his mental illness? Well, it started with his psychiatrist, Charles Wilson, otherwise known as Lord Moran. Moran was Winston's psychiatrist from 1940 to 1965. He saw the politician through his political career from two weeks into his term as prime minister until the very end of Churchill's life. In fact, Moran actually traveled with Winston throughout his career, above and beyond the call of duty for a psychiatrist, but Moran is quoted as regarding Winston as, quote, the greatest Englishman since Chatham, and said that caring for Winston was his personal wartime duty. Just a few months before Winston's death in January of 1965, Clementine found out that Moran was planning to publish a book about his relationship with Winston, and she was pissed. Quote, I had always supposed that the relationship between a doctor and his patient was one of complete confidence. Despite the entire Churchill family being against the book, Moran had been offered a ton of money to divulge his knowledge of the inner workings of Winston's brain, and he couldn't turn it down. Like most people post-war, even years and years after, Moran needed the money. And so 15 months after Winston's death, Moran published The Struggle for Survival. It was advertised as Moran's fleshed-out notes that he had taken during Winston's decades of treatment, during which time Winston constantly battled with that cursed black dog. But there was a problem with that. Moran hadn't taken extensive notes during Winston's treatment. The book was written from memory. It's hard enough to write down in detail what one did during the past week, let alone recall specifics of 25 years of constant therapy. But Moran wanted to write the book, and the public wanted to read it, and so a book was written and then poured over by later Churchill biographers and casual history lovers, who took Moran's word as gospel and used it as a source for their own books, which in turn were used as sources for other books and articles and documentaries about Winston. Andrew Jenks, quote, the more depressed Churchill appeared to be, the worse his black dog was, and the more Lord Moran looked like a hero, the more Moran is responsible for helping keep the world's greatest hero healthy. Paul Reed adds, Moran told a story and it stuck. Dr. Joseph Storr first used Moran's diagnosis of Winston's clinical depression in an essay about the politician, and Storr later became the first noted Churchill biographer. Storr had no reason to doubt Moran, who was a personal friend of his. Storr, like everyone else, was under the impression that Moran had kept careful notes of Winston's treatment and written the book from those, and so Storr used Moran's book as his main source. But Moran contradicts himself in his own book. In the beginning of the tome, Moran says that Winston often succumbed to, quote, the inborn melancholia of the Churchill blood, 
but retracts the observation later in the book. Additionally, in the final chapter of The Struggle for Survival, Moran states that any bouts of depression Winston may have gone through in his life were over by the start of the First World War and were never revisited. Storr either overlooked these contradictions or didn't want to acknowledge that his friend was an unreliable narrator. He wrote an article, then a book, about Churchill that largely focused on his alleged lifelong battle with mental health. And despite Martin Gilbert's official eight-volume biography of Winston never mentioning depression, most other articles or books or even passing mentions of Winston in the decades to come made sure to note that terrible black dog. Author Paul Reed says that despite the volume of books, including specifically mental health books, that obsess over Winston's depression, you won't find a single reputable one among them. Reed, quote, The extent of the medical file on Churchill is that there is none, as far as mental health goes. When Jenks asked Reed in his podcast interview why Reed believed his fellow Last Lion author, William Manchester, had been so insistent on Winston's depression diagnosis, Reed said simply that Manchester had depression and wanted to see something of himself in his hero. In fact, that may be why Winston was able to get away with being seen as both a strong political man and a depressive. Historically, that label could destroy a man's image, but Winston had and has a strong enough reputation as a hero that even the most snide of mental health scoffers look at Churchill's alleged depression and see it as inspirational. Depressives and neurotypicals alike look at Churchill as someone who overcame tremendous hurdles to save the world. That's not to say that Winston didn't have his struggles, or his demons. As I mentioned, he had at least one speech impediment that he doggedly worked through each time he spoke publicly. He had an ego and a temper, both of which often got in his way of progress. And he was, famously, a heavy drinker. In fact, alongside his spreadsheet of mentions of depression, Reed kept a spreadsheet of mentions of alcohol or drinking as he made his way through documents by, about, and to Winston. There were hundreds of those instances, and these days Winston would be classified as an alcoholic. And Reed acknowledges that many people point to Winston's excessive drinking as possible self-medication to numb the depression. But when Reed wrote up a detailed description of Winston's personality and habits, including his temper, his drinking and tearfulness, and including that single mention of the black dog, and presented it blind to two prominent psychologists, both of them said that it described someone going through normal episodes of moderate adult depression, but not clinical depression. One of these doctors was Dr. Michael First, who contributed to the dsm 4 as well as the 11th revision of the International Classification of Diseases. It is conceded, in a follow-up to Jenks's first episode, that while Winston may not have been a chronic depressive, he may have had something like dysthymia, or persistent mild depression. While Paul Reed wishes the incorrect view of a deeply depressed Winston Churchill would be righted, he acknowledged in his interview that doing so would be nearly impossible. It's asking someone to prove a negative, and that just can't be done. And it's hardly the only inaccurate thing about Winston out there. There are tons of famous quotes attributed to Winston that he never said. Quotes like, if you're going through hell, keep going. Or, never, never, never give up. Certainly inspirational, and kind of Churchill-esque as far as doggedness goes, but he didn't say those things. But just as he observes that it's not hurting anyone to be inspired by one of those quotes, Reed also believes that it's not hurting anyone to hear the incorrect story of Winston's black dog and be inspired by his heroic career. In fact, Reed doesn't even think Churchill would mind. If someone who is indeed going through hell is inspired by a false Churchill quote to keep going, well, good. Thanks for checking out this week's episode of We're All Mad Here. If you like what I'm doing, you can go to patreon.com slash allmadpodcast. It would really help me right now as uh, due to COVID, this is my only job. But if you also lost your source of income to COVID, I totally understand if you can't afford to be a patron anymore. But you can also help me out for free by going to iTunes and leaving a five-star review, which helps people find the podcast. And also a reminder, we do have stickers. So if you would like a sticker or two, you can send your snail mail address to me over social media. Uh, You can do that through Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. Thanks, and I'll see you guys next time.